The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar today. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes. We've got uh, just about half of the people signed on now. It's 12 o'clock, so we'll wait just two or three minutes, get a few more people signed on, and then we'll we'll go ahead and get started. So sit tight, and we'll start here in about two to three minutes. Thanks. All right. Well, it's 12:03. We'll go ahead and get started here with our with our uh, webinar today. I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, today for this. I do have a couple of guests with me today. I've got Randy Wallen from Old Castle Infrastructure and Mike Blackham from Geneva Pipe and Precast. We want to welcome both of those uh, attendees with us today. That'll be the with us. Randy wanted something, he, I believe you wanted to say something before we got started, so I'd like to turn a couple of minutes over to you, Randy. I just wanted to wish everyone a happy April and hope everyone's doing okay. I too hope everyone's doing okay. All right, Mike, anything you want to share before we get started on our webinar with everyone? Uh, just same as Randy, hope everyone's doing okay, and I guess just introduce myself as the the new engineer for geneva absolutely so mike mike recently was working with a company called mak consulting doing design for uh precast manufacturers across the country and was hired i want to say about a week ago maybe two weeks ago what two weeks uh, ago? march 1st was the official date okay so just a just been just a few weeks that he's been with geneva so he's their uh, structural engineer we'll be working with them so we want to welcome mike uh, to our association, and and we're happy to happy to have him back. He used to work for Old Castle up in Boise, and now he's work, working for Geneva Pipe and Precast. So, uh, welcome back. We're excited to have you. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just a, a little bit about how this is going to work today. I've got a couple of polls that I'll be asking throughout, so make sure you're paying attention. And and uh, I'll I'll open up some polls throughout the the process, and I'll be letting you know when we'll do those. So you'll just answer and click on the the answer that you think is correct, and then. Uh, we'll be taking some polls and discussing those. We are going to be talking about the fundamentals of concrete pipe today. So we'll jump right in. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jason Allen. I'm a licensed engineer. I'm a graduate, proud graduate from the University of Utah. I have bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering, and my emphasis was water resources engineering. 
I've got about 18 years of experience in the engineering field. And I started out as a surveyor and then kind of worked up through there, did design for land development, worked in the public sector as the Morgan County Engineer and Public Works Director, went back into consulting where I did mostly drainage design for large roadway projects for DOTs, counties, cities. Uh, I have owned my own business. And now I am a marketing engineer for the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. I'm really excited for this job. I love what I do. I love going out and meeting with people and talking and, and sharing ideas and helping them solve problems that they come up with. So for those of you that don't know who the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association is and what we do, we have some member companies that I want to rec recognize. First, as I mentioned, we had the two gentlemen that just addressed us uh, from a couple of these member companies, Geneva Pipe and Precast. They've got plants in uh, St. George, Orem, and Salt Lake City. And then we've got Old Castle Infrastructure. Uh, they have plants in Ogden, Idaho Falls, and up in Nampa or Boise, Idaho. And so that's that's the Mountain State's market area is Utah and Idaho. I, I spend a lot of time uh, traveling around and meeting with engineers. But we also want to recognize two other companies that have uh, board seats on our board of directors, Ashgrove and Holsom, who su supply all of our cement. And so we're, we're grateful for, for them and for the support that they give. So we want to give a shout out to our and recognize the members of those companies as well, Ashgrove Cement and Wholesome Cement. So I sent out an email this week and let everybody know kind of what we're, what we're doing here. And I, I call these the pajama presentations. Uh, I know I wanted to talk a little bit about what the purpose of these are. I know a lot of us are working from home. Many of us uh, have been asked to make some pretty big changes over the last couple of weeks. Uh, one of the big changes for me is, as I mentioned before, I get to go around and speak to a lot of engineers and visit with them and talk about some of the concerns they have and the problems that they're they're having and help them come up with solutions and, and find some precast options for them. It's been really difficult for me not being able to go out and meet face to face with folks. And so uh, I've spent a lot of time in my office on the phone doing uh, web video chats, uh, talking with folks, doing more virtual visits, uh, virtual visits and answering those questions. Uh, but it's been really tough not being in front of people and, and not working with them. The benefit is, obviously, I get to work all day in my pajamas, so that's that's nice. Um, but but I wanted to talk about what the purpose of these webinars are. I would like to do one of these a week. I'm hoping to, to do one on different topics. So this one today is going to be, obviously, about the fundamentals of, of reinforced concrete pipe. We've got other topics that we, that we have done presentations on that we would like to share with you. And the, the first goal and purpose of these presentations is to build technical skill. We want to help you. This is a good time where we can maybe take a step back, sharpen the saw, try to improve some of the areas where maybe we're a little bit weaker and improve on our technical skill in some of these areas. So that's that's what I'm hoping to give to you is to, to provide you some, some additional training and opportunities to learn and grow and develop. Uh, and part of these I will be sending out at the end. I'll get a list of everybody that did sign up and I will have your, your email. I will be sending out PDH certificates next week to all those that want them. So uh, by, by attending and taking part in these presentations, you, you'll qualify for one professional development hour. So I'll be emailing those out. So each week, I'm hoping to do this for as long as we're all you know, working from home, uh, you know, provide these to everybody. Hopefully we're back at it in four to six weeks uh, back to normal. But if not, then we'll continue to provide these each week. We'll get different topics. Um, maybe we'll talk about box culverts. We've got other precast products we can talk about, uh, talk about installation of pipe. We could talk about, um, you know, some of these other things that, that would help you. Also, maybe some skills that are, you know, improving your presentation skills. I've got a presentation on, on uh, millennials that we can talk about as well. So there's a lot of opportunities, not just in the pipe field, but uh, that's what we want to do to help you build skill. The second one is to somewhat provide a break. I know sometimes when we're working from home, we get we get caught up in this uh, in the monotony of doing the same thing over and over again. And so I'm hoping this can provide you with a little bit of break. Uh, we want to provide you with some some you know education and knowledge, but also maybe provide you with some little bit of entertainment to break things up a little bit. So um, and then also we want to uh, it it appeals to my need to be the center of attention. So I, those of you that know me know that I love to be in front of people. I love to be in the center of attention. And that's what this helps uh, helps me out too. So with that, each week I will be showing you a picture of what I'm Hey, wearing. Jason. Yeah, Randy. 
Hey, when uh, doesn't doesn't the software uh, keep track of how attentive people are to your presentation and rate them? Does yes, it get, great great point, Randy. It gives an attentive score for every person on how attentive you were. So whether you were paying attention or doing other things, um, how you answer the poll questions, different things like that. So yeah, it, it will it will let me know who's paying attention and who's not. So thank you for bringing that up. Randy. Maybe you should give an award, an award for the most attentive. An award for the most attentive. I like that. I, I I'll give. I'll be I'll be awarding the most attentive person each week. That's a great great suggestion. Thank you, Randy, for for suggesting that. So this week for this week's pajama presentation, this is my my pajama, the pajamas I'm wearing today to give this presentation. This is my Superman onesie. So if uh, if anyone needs a hero for hire to come and teach them about concrete pipe, I am your man. So this is my uh, my my outfit for today. So this is what I'll be giving you. Okay, let's talk about what, what we're hoping that you get out of this today. We're going to discuss the basics of reinforced concrete pipe, or RCP. We're going to discuss a little bit about manufacturing and testing and, and help you understand a little bit about what, what goes into making this pipe, testing this pipe, and ensuring that, that it's structurally sound. And additionally, we're going to talk about a little bit of design here and what you as design engineers need to be including on this in the in the specifications and in your plans and so that's what we're going to cover today understand that it's all pretty basic you have an opportunity with this webinar program to ask questions as we go so if you do have any questions i will i will uh, try to answer those uh, as we go through um but if we if if i don't i'll just get it to the end and then i'll answer those questions at the very end so um, right now, let's go ahead and practice this poll question here. Let's see if we've got an ability here to do this. So I'm going to ask our first poll question, and that is, are you also wearing your pajamas right now? So that is your poll. I've just opened the poll, so go ahead and answer the 12% the, uh, so far. Yes, of course, is one answer. One, the other is no, but I wish I was. So it looks like we'll keep this open for just a little bit more here. Still collecting responses. All right, so it looks like we're good there. So for those of you that wanna know how it turned out, 10% uh, said, yes, of course, I am wearing my pajamas right now. 90% no, but you wish you were, so that, uh, I'm, I'm positive that every one of you that's not in your pajamas right now definitely wish you were. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Let's go back here to uh, to reinforce concrete pipe, and we'll get started here. All right. the The bottom line here. Uh, this is for anybody that sat through any of my presentations. You've probably seen this slide, and it's very important. We need to remember that pipe needs to serve two critical functions. The first is it acts as a conduit. And the second is that it must be, it must act as a structure to hold a load above it. Okay, the concrete pipe is considered a rigid pipe. We have rigid and flexible pipe. We're not going to talk about flexible pipe today. Uh, we'll do that some other time. But with concrete pipe is a rigid structure, and it is a structure that is bedded with soil. So when we deliver this pipe to the job site, we are delivering a structure to the job site. You remove that from the truck and you're placing the structure in the in the trench. This is very different from some of the flexible products. So you are receiving the structure and then you need to handle it with care and get it in the trench and then backfill it. So how this looks and how the structural system of a reinforced concrete pipe looks is that the, the pipe wall itself is going to use or, or provide most of the strength. So depending on the class and the bedding type and the the backfill that we have around it, 70 to 90 percent of your system strength is going to come from the pipe wall itself. So the pipe and the, the concrete, the steel, everything in it. So a majority is coming from that. The foundation and bedding will provide between 10 and 30 percent of that system strength as well. So, so a majority of it is from the pipe, which is why it's so important that we take good care of and making sure that our contractors are getting that pipe into the trench carefully so that we maintain and preserve that strength. When we talk about concrete pipe and, and as a design, 
the design life of a concrete pipe is is a hundred years. We say a hundred years, even though we have many pipes that are in service right now that are well beyond that one hundred year design life. We're not going to talk too much about hydraulics today, but I do want to mention it because sometimes when we're doing our design, the recommendation from the manufacturer is to use a Manning's N of zero point zero one two or or uh, 0 0.012. Uh, some people have, I've seen them use 0 0.011, 0 0.013, somewhere in there, but the manufacturers recommend 0 0.012. So, from a structural standpoint, these pipes and precast products are designed and stamped by our plant engineer. So, when it comes to making sure that it's structurally sound and can hold the load, the plant itself is assuming the liability. Okay, but with, that's assuming that the engineer spec'd out the correct class of pipe and gave the correct loading, and it's also assuming that the contractor has installed it correctly. So if they're installing it incorrectly and mishandling it, then we assume no liability for that. Just just the 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 liability associated with the structural aspect of it that it meets the structural loads that the design engineer called out. So. Let's talk design life for a minute. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, I love this picture. I've seen this pipe. This is a, a piece of pipe that we actually have in the Dallas office of the American Concrete Pipe Association. It was installed in 1842 in Mohawk, New York. And it was removed and taken out of service in 1986. It was about 145 years that this pipe was in service. Interestingly enough, this pipe was still structurally sound when it was removed. The reason they took it out was they needed to upsize the line. This was a this was a sewer line, and they needed more capacity. So they pulled this pipe out, and the American Concrete Pipe Association asked for a section of it that they could display in their office. And so it's sitting in their office right now in Dallas. It's really cool to look at it. No cracks, no issues, still structurally sound after 145 years in the ground. Here's an example of one that's a little bit closer to home. This is a picture of, this is in City Creek. Uh, back in 1908, there was some major, major flooding in City Creek, and it overtopped the, the channel, and so they decided to pipe it. And so sections of this pipe are about 48 inches up to uh, 72 inches, depending on the section. But they, they decided to do a reinforced cast-in-place pipe. So if you notice here on this picture, this is, uh, them with the they use train cars and little rails to drop the concrete in after they had framed it and put in the reinforcing. So this picture you can see the framing and the reinforcing around it, and this is what it looked like when it was done. So this was back installed in 1910. So this pipe is currently 110 years old, and it's still sections of it are still in service. This is what it looks like on the inside today. So you can actually see those wood panels. You could see that it, uh, you know, where they where they had the the frame of the wood panels there. There are some sections where the steel is showing through and it's it's cracked out there, but it's still structurally sound. Uh, they took some core samples to determine what uh, if there were any issues, and it, it's still in service and still structurally sound today. So these pipes we know will last a long time. I know I mentioned we weren't going to talk much about hydraulics, but I did want to bring this up. This is an app that is put out by the American Concrete Pipe Association called Compare Flow. So if you go into your app store, uh, whether it's uh, for Android phones or, or, or Apple phones, this is, you just look up Compare Flow. And this is an app that you can use. This is what it looks like when you download it in the top left-hand corner there, Compare Flow. It's orange with the ACPA logo and the pipe. When you open this app, and you click on that middle one there that says flow capacities, you get this screen that allows you to compare different flows of different size pipes, different pipe materials, different shapes of pipe, whether they're elliptical or arch or a box culvert. And you can type in inputs like here where you can say what the roughness coefficient is, the pipe diameter, the slope. And it gives you, if you notice down at the bottom there, the pipe flow of a 2% slope, 24-inch concrete pipe, the, the velocity is 11 feet per second, and the pipe flow is approximately 35 cubic feet per second. You can then compare and contrast that with other pipes. For instance, if you did a circular flexible pipe, you can click on the roughness coefficient, and it'll give you a, a, a choice on what you want to choose. And it's got different 
different values of corrugated metal pipe, uh, HDPE, PVC. So you could compare different different flows of different pipe materials. So for instance, if you chose a HDPE with corrugation growth, you could compare and say that a concrete pipe will get 34 over 34 cubic feet per second and the plastic pipe will get 23 feet per second. So you can, when you're out in the field, you can do quick calculations to determine how much flow these pipes can handle. Kind of a cool little tool. It's free to download. Feel free to do that again. It's called Compare Flow. So go ahead and write that down or download it now or download it later. But it's a cool tool. I've used it in the field a number of times. So today we're going to discuss some of these specifications. They're very, uh, we're going to go very high level on them. So we're not going to delve into them too much, but I want you to understand uh, what's in each of these specifications. The first one is ASTM C76. This is a manufacturing specification that we use when we make the pipe. And this is what we kind of refer to this as our Bible. This is a really important uh, spec when we're when we're manufacturing the pipe to let us know how much steel and how, how thick our walls need to be and different things like that. We're going to briefly touch on ASTM C497. Again, these are all national specifications put out through ASTM. Uh, I sit on some of these committees that writes these specifications, so I'm involved in the process of writing and putting these together. But in the testing, when we talk about our D-load test or our three-edge bearing test, this is the specification that references that on how we're supposed to do that test. And so when we're verifying that the load, the load requirements are met, we're, we're meeting this specification. And then lastly, ASTM C1479, this is the installation specification, and we're not going to go too much into installation today. Uh, we'll save that for another presentation. But this is an important spec when we start talking about the bedding and the, the type of installation that we're going to be doing for when we're calling out which class of pipe to have on the spec or in our specifications and in our design drawings here. So those are the three that we're going to be focusing on today. So let's talk concrete. We know that concrete is great in compression, and we know that it can struggle a little bit with tension. About one-tenth of the, the load it can handle in tension as opposed to compression. So in order to fix that and to make it as strong as possible, we take a material, obviously. We all learned this in our, in our uh, reinforced concrete class in, in, our, uh, in school, but we take a, something that is really good in tension or steel, and we... we put it together with our concrete so that we have a structure that is good in both tension and compression. So if you notice on the left hand side here of this figure, you've got this pipe and there's areas that are black and areas that are white. Those black areas are our tension zones when we're loading a pipe top and bottom, which is what we do when we deload a pipe. And it's and the reason we do that is because it's it basically mimics the type of loading we're going to have when we when we put the pipe in the ground and we backfill and we're putting either a live load of a traffic load on top of it or a dead load of the, the soil or the earth load or a, a structure up above it. We're basically mimicking that, a top and bottom load. And so when we load this top and bottom, we get four tension zones in this pipe. And if you notice, you get it, you get the tension zones on the inside of the pipe. So the, the top, which is the crown of the pipe and the bottom of the pipe, which we call the flow line on the inside of that pipe, we get tension zones. Additionally, as it tries to deflect outward, we get tension zones on the outer half of the pipe at the spring line, which is that line right across the middle of the pipe. If we had a pipe flowing 50% full, full that line would be what we call the spring line of the pipe. And so that's where we get the tension. So when we when we load a pipe in the deload machine, we would expect to see cracking at any one of those, any one of those uh, areas there. So you've got either the top and bottom on the inside of the pipe or on the outside of the pipe as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me for just one second. I just got a text that said I'm breaking up a little bit, so I'm going to give a little break here and try to do something else here. Hang on. Might be my internet connection, so I apologize if I'm breaking up. All right. Okay, we'll jump right back into this. Let's try right now, let's do another poll, and let's talk about concrete pipe here. Okay. Here we go. Let's do our second poll. I'm going to make this. This the question is how many standard classes of circular RCP are there? So how many standard classes? Your choices are three, four, 
five or six. Okay. All right, it looks like most have voted. 91, we're waiting for a couple of more here. We'll wait just a few more seconds for those of you who didn't vote. Remember, it tracks your attentiveness. All right. Okay, let's see here. So, our answers are 25% said three classes of pipe, 15% said four different standard classes of pipe, 53% said five standard classes of pipe, and 8% said six standard classes of pipe. The correct answer is five. There are five standard classes of pipe, class one, class two, class three, class four, and class five. So congratulations to those 53%. You are correct. Congratulations. You win nothing. All right. Let's go back. Hey, to Jason. Yes. I'll, I'll make a comment to that one, and I, I think Randy will probably agree. Um, although there are five standard classes, typically you'll only see the manufacturers make class three, four, and five. Very good. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. When we When we spec these classes of pipe, and we'll talk about why they only spec the class three through five. Um, keep in mind that what, what you put on the plans, it's always good practice to reach out to the manufacturer. In this market, it would be either Old Castle or Geneva Pipe. Find out what they are making, what they are manufacturing. That's a, that's a really good practice. So thanks for bringing that up, Mike. I, I do appreciate you pointing that out. We, we may, while they're available in the spec, uh, they may not be available locally. So keep that in mind. That's a very good point, Mike. Okay. So let's look at ASTM C76. Here we have a table, and I, I know that this just gets all of you excited because you're all engineers and you just love seeing numbers, numbers and tables. But I'm gonna walk you through this real quickly. This is directly copied and pasted from the ASTM C76 specification. So the first thing you'll notice up at the top is this is for a class three pipe. So this is class three, which I would consider to be the most commonly used uh, pipe, and, and we'll talk about why a little bit later, but class three is very common, so that's, we see right at the top there, class three. We then notice here it talks about D-load to produce a hundredth inch crack and the ultimate load. We're going to talk in depth about this in a few minutes, so I'm just going to skip right over that and we'll come back to it. On the left-hand side over here, you have your internal diameter of the pipe. So this table, I just, I didn't take all of them. We can go bigger than 54 inch, but I just, for the sake of the space, I just went from 12 inch up to 54 inch pipe. Uh, next to it, we've got three different columns. The first is your wall A. The second is your wall B. And the third is your wall C. Now this is the different thicknesses that you've got. And we're going to focus on wall B right now because that is the most common that we use and that we see. So if you'll notice here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on that here, and we're going to look at a 24-inch pipe here, okay? So a 24-inch pipe, if you go over to your wall B column on the, on the right-hand side, you'll notice for a 24-inch pipe, it gives us the wall thickness and it gives us circular reinforcement. Okay, we're going to focus on the circular reinforcement because there is a, an ability for elliptical reinforcement. However, it's not as common because it's very finicky. It's not as easy to, to manipulate. The idea behind elliptical reinforcement is that it saves you from having to put in two cages on larger diameters. The problem with elliptical reinforcement is the idea is that it will be in all of those tension zones. If you remember that picture I showed you that showed the tension zones, they weren't always in the same spot. So the elliptical reinforcement will put reinforcement in those tension zones. The problem is if you don't put the pipe exactly, exactly in the right location, in the right orientation, then it's, it's very problematic because you, you, you'll have now, instead of having it in the right place, it could be in the absolute wrong place. So elliptical reinforcement is not as common, but it is available in the spec. We don't make uh, elliptical reinforcement here locally. We just do circular. So 
If you notice for a wall B, a general rule of thumb on wall thickness on a pipe with a B wall is that you take the, the diameter of the pipe in feet and then you just add one to it. So notice a 24 inch pipe, which would be two feet, you add one inch and then the wall thickness is three inches. Um, if you notice on a 36 inch pipe, it's kind of the same thing. 36 is three plus one and you get a four inch pipe, uh, four inch thick wall there. So on the 24, I'm gonna go back to this 24 inch pipe. Notice the circular reinforcement. This cage is 0 0.07. Up at the top, it talks about reinforcement is square inches per linear foot of pipe wall. So that is 0 0.07 square inches of steel per foot of pipe wall. So we have in our plants, we have um, either using wire mesh and then welding it together and putting it at that that correct they just use the the correct size of wire mesh to to get that much steel or we have a couple of our pipe plants actually manufacture their own cages and they'll they'll spin the cages themselves and make those so um again where we provide plant tours every fall i would encourage those of you that haven't ever been to a plant tour um look out for our invitation in september uh to come to a plant tour and watch how we manufacture these cages and these pipes it's really really cool uh, when we get to the higher diameter pipes, like a 36-inch pipe, notice that there's now an inner cage and an outer cage. So you have the inner cage that is 0.17 square inches and the outer cage that's 0.1 square inches. So at the larger diameter pipes, 36 inches and up in a class 3 pipe, you're going to have two different cages of steel. And that's to make sure that we're when we get in those larger pipes, we've got good crack control in all of those tension zones. So that's the purpose of those. So let's talk about our strength classes. I mentioned that we were going to come back to the D-load, and the D-load has two different criteria that we're going to get to, but these D-load numbers that I'm showing you now are the D-load, the loads required to produce a one-hundredth of an inch crack. So for a class one, it's zero to 800 pounds per foot per foot, and I'll come back to that in a moment of what that pound per foot per foot is. 800 to 1,000 is class two, 1,000 to 1,350 is class three, 1,350 to 2,000 pounds is a class four, and 2,000 to 3,000 pounds is a class five. Now, those are our standard classes. However, if you get into a situation where you have either a lot of fill, you know, we're talking 50, 60 feet of fill on a pipe, or if you've got a really heavy load on top of it, whether that's construction loads, or dead loads of a, of a wall or something on top of it, and it's over that 3,000 pounds per foot per foot, we in our plants can do direct design to provide you with a pipe, and we can make our own mix, our own steel design. This is just what the standard sizes are in ASTM C76, but we are able to build any pipe um, to whatever your specifications are to meet your load requirements. So keep that in mind that if it doesn't, if it goes above a class five, we can provide a pipe that will work for you. So keep that in mind. Hey, hey, Jason. Yes. I, I want to ask Mike. I know Mike's designed something really deep, but I don't remember how deep of a pipe he designed. Maybe he can tell us. Absolutely. Yeah, we had some <clears throat> pipe up in Montana, and it was 82 feet deep. And if you kind of looked at the, the equivalent D load, what we're looking at here, it would have probably been about a 6,000 D load. Wow. And so they had to, we had to go with a much thicker wall, obviously. I believe it was 30 inch pipe and we had a eight inch wall. Wow, that is, that is impressive. I did just get a comment from somebody that said, I think they're questioning my, my, my poll question earlier saying, so there's five standard classes and one special class. So he's, I think he's, He's trying to justify his choice of six. So, um, sorry, you still win nothing. I won't say your name though over the over the the thing for fear that maybe you're you're ashamed that you got it wrong, Woody. All right, next um, three edge bearing test. Let's talk about the bearing test and how we determine and make sure that these pipes are meeting these load capacities here. So the three edge bearing test determines the strength of the pipe for two different criteria. The first is a load to produce a crack with a width of 0 0.01 inches. And the reason we do that 0 0.01 inches, a, a hundredth inch crack, 
and is still considered minor hairline crack. The pipe is functional. There is no structural deficiency in these minor hairline cracks. I'll talk about cracking briefly in a moment, but, but that's why we, we check to a 100th inch. We have little leaf gauges that we use to determine where that 100th inch is as we're loading the pipe and we crack it and we get to that 100th inch crack. Also, we take it to ultimate load. So there's two different deload values, one for 100th inch, one for ultimate. Ultimate load is the load that it takes to, to create a structural failure in this pipe. So as we load it on the deload, we're trying to get it to failure point. And it's a, so that ultimate load is always gonna be higher than our 100th inch deload. So when we talk about cracks, 100th inch cracks are minor and they're only need to be noted. This is according to the FHWA handbook and guidelines. And the reason that we only need to, to uh, note them is because of something called autogenous healing. Now, autogenous healing, when, when Randy first told me about this, I thought he was making it up. I, I didn't, didn't believe that it was true. However, we did a little experiment, and this experiment turned out amazing. You can actually watch a video on the uh, ACPA website. It's concretepipe.org. We made a little, a little video. I'll share it on our Facebook later today so that if you guys go to our Facebook, Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association on Facebook, I'll go ahead and share that video that you can watch to see uh, what happens when you autogenously heal a pipe that is cracked? So what happens is that when, when in the presence of moisture and water in a pipe, if it's cracked, there's calcium hydroxide in the cement and it's activated by that water and it creates a, a limestone or a calcium carbonate and it fills in those cracks and it seals it. So a lot of times when you have like really big cracks, anything over say five hundredths of an inch, it's gonna be really difficult for that, that calcium carbonate to fill in and to seal that. But anything smaller than say five hundredths of an inch, which is about the thickness of a dime. So anything smaller than the thickness of a dime, we're not super worried about because uh, this can, can, can seal itself and heal itself through the process called autogenous healing. I don't wanna spoil the ending for you on that video, but I'm going to anyways, cause I don't know how many of you are gonna actually go watch it. But what we did was we cracked the pipe. We put it in the deload, we cracked it to um, just under a 500th of an inch crack. And then we sealed the bottom and we filled it up with water for about three months and let it sit in the yard for three months until it had completely healed and it was no longer leaking water. So now we have this autogenously healed pipe that's completely sealed up. It's not leaking water anymore. And we took it back to the deload machine and loaded it again. We wanted to see if it would crack in the same location and with the same loading, less loading or more load. And what we found out was that because that limestone and that calcium carbonate is actually stronger than the concrete, it cracked in a different location. And Interestingly enough, it cracked with 23% more load on it than it did originally. So the pipe itself, after sitting in the yard with water on it and autogenously healing for three months, was 23% stronger than it was when we originally cracked it. So when we talk to cities and, and engineers and they're worried about, about small minor hairline cracks, this is a good experiment, some good anecdotal evidence to show that minor cracking isn't in and, in and of itself going to necessarily hurt the structure of the pipe. In fact, it can, it, it, over time, the pipe will continue to get, get stronger as the pipe cures. So that was an interesting- Hey, Jason. Yes, Randy. The, the cool thing there was it had sealed and didn't leak anymore within about three days. Yeah, great point, great point. Yeah, we wanted to make sure it was completely sealed all the way through, but as far as the leaking, Randy's right. After just a matter of a few days, it was done leaking. But for it to completely seal and reach the strength that we wanted it, we let it sit for a couple of months. But that's a that's a good point. One within a week, some of these smaller cracks are usually healed in the presence of water. This hey, is Jason. Our... One more comment. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, if if anyone wants to see that in person, come out during Pipe Week to the manufacturers, and you'll see some of those cracked pipes filled with water and healed up and you'll see that that autogenous healing in person. That's right. That's uh that's good. You know, sometimes when you're when when these pipes heal, 
Um, a good example is sometimes when our bones heal and they heal up and they get stronger, that, that spot where it heals makes it stronger. So if you broke your arm again, a lot of times when you break it, um, a good friend of mine mentioned to me that his son broke his arm, it rehealed, it reset, and then he broke it again snowboarding and it broke in a different location. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing there where, and that's what happens with autogenous healing. So thanks for that, uh, that little update there. So uh, this is our, our three edge bearing test frame. This is what it looked like back when Randy first started. If you notice on the left hand side there, about a hundred and hundred years ago when Randy first started in the concrete pipe business, uh, you can see him. Al, you can't really see him. He's just really little standing behind all those tall guys there. But anyways, this is um, what they used to do to load these pipes. Now we have a little bit different machinery today. This is our three edge bearing test. And this is what we use to make sure that these pipes can handle these loads. If you notice, I, I've, I've highlighted the one, two, and three. Those are the edges, the three edges there. Uh, up, up top, you've got your rigid steel beam and a wood beam that goes across with a, usually we'll put a rubber strip wood beam underneath that so that it can absorb that cushion so it isn't really um, abrasive against that concrete. So we put that on there. Down at the bottom, we have two little rubber strips uh, that are rounded at the edges so, edges, so it'll hold that pipe in place. It's really important that that spacing is correct because what we're trying to do is we're trying to hold the pipe in place without having it roll on us. So we have a little bit of space in between, but we don't want that pipe. That we we want to duplicate a point load as much as possible. We don't want to widen those. I saw someone one time was 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 doing it too wide when they were testing it. And they were like, man, we're getting such huge loads on this and huge trace before we're cracking it. And I'm like, well, that's because your spacing is twice as much what it should be. Every time we test a new diameter of pipe, we have to change that. And the spacing on those little rubber strips on the bottom of the pipe need to be one inch per foot of diameter. So if it's a 24 inch pipe, it's two inches. If it's a 48, it's four inches. So we got to make sure that those are being being set correctly. If you notice in this picture here, these are the rubber, rubber strips that we have. This is a pipe that's already been cracked. This one was actually cracked to ultimate. So you could see on the, on the top left-hand side of this picture, there's a pretty significant crack there. We took this one to ultimate when we were testing that one. And this is what the machine looks like before you start loading it and as you're loading it. So this is in there, you've got, notice your steel beam with the wood and the, and the rubber strip there, and then your, your, uh, your strips along the side there. So when we look at doing the calculations for deload, we want to look, these are pounds per foot of length of pipe per foot of diameter. So for those of you that have been to our plants, you'll know that our pipes are manufactured in eight foot sticks of pipe. So we would, we would do eight feet uh, is that foot of pipe and then a foot of diameter. So when we look at ASTM C76, these are the numbers we get and this is where we get them. So we'll zoom in there and you can see. D load to produce a hundredth of an inch crack is 1350. D load to produce the ultimate load is 2000. Again, remember this is for class three. So let's do a sample calculation here. You, uh, you engineers, I know you're really excited about math. So this is going to be very simple, easy math. This is, this math is so easy. I think even an architect could probably do it. So, um, we'll look at this at hundredth of an inch load. We take our D load for our hundredth of an inch D load, 1350. We multiply that by eight feet. And then we multiply that for by two feet because we're doing a, a 24 inch diameter and we get 21,600 pounds. So as our D load operator is loading that pipe, he's watching the gauge and he's making sure that it gets to that 21,600 pounds. If it gets to there without cracking, we know that it met, it, that it met a, uh, our, our class three pipe. All right. So, so that's, that's what uh, what we're doing there with that hundredth of an inch crack load. If it doesn't crack and we can't and we can't get that that leaf gauge in there, uh, then we know it meets a class three. Similarly for the ultimate load, we go two thousand pounds times eight feet uh, times two feet, and we get thirty two thousand pounds. So that's how much load we load it to, and we're hoping that it doesn't collapse and 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 break on us and completely uh, be cracked up at 32,000 pounds. If we can do that, then, then we know that this pipe meets the class three specifications from the ASTM C76 spec. So, uh, that's a, that's a really good, 
good way to check and as we do that. So when you come out for the plant tours, as Mike said, you're going to get to see the autogenously healed pipe. We usually throw a pipe up there and, and put it in the deload and crack it so we can show you this process firsthand. But we'd love to have you out to come and take a look and see what we do at those plant tours. So uh, this is this is why we do it. So we're going to take a quick little... Hey, Jason. Break. Yes. I, I think the interesting thing is it's become so routine that we wouldn't have anything, you know, crack like that. But where we might be being close to design strength, we're usually way over design. But maybe we need to ship a pipe that's three days old and we test it and find out we still would meet that kind of design strength. Great. So uh, we're, we're doing compressive breaks daily to make sure our concrete strength's good. But the deloads we're going to do as per ASTO. Got it. That's a great point. Great point. Yeah. So we know that concrete pipe gets stronger over time. And so, as Randy says, if we need to ship something out early, uh, we want to make sure that it still meets those ASTM loads. And so, as it gets it delivered to the site and installed, it's going to get you know stronger over time because, especially if we're shipping these out early, like before a uh, you know before our seven day strengths even. So, great point, Randy. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. Frequently asked questions time. I've got some questions that I get asked by engineers a lot. So we're going to, to go through some of these questions here. Um, and this will help us understand what we need to put on the plans and stuff. But first, this is uh, someone requested this yesterday. They said that they they were hoping to, to have this question answered. They heard that I played in a band. So they wanted to know, Jason, do you really play in a band? Is that true? And I said, yes, I've played in a number of bands. The one I currently play in right now is called Jason Allen is a Jerk. Uh, I play organ and rap, and my friend Beatboxes, you can look us up on YouTube. Um, we are every bit as terrible as you would expect. So go ahead and, and look that up if you want. Similarly, I also, years, years ago, there was a band whose lead singer fell ill, and they called me to fill in uh, for that band, and I... They said that because I looked so similar to him and sounded so similar that they wanted me to come in and play with them. And that band was Queen. I did a photo shoot with them. And I, I think it's shocking and striking the similarities between me and the lead singer of Queen, Freddie Mercury. So for those of you that are having a hard time telling which is me and which is Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury is the one on the left. I'm the one on the right. A um, couple of other pictures. I mean, it's just uncanny how how closely we look similar. I mean, I can't tell even hardly. The, the color of the pants is about the only difference that I could tell, really. Um, for the And so just a summary here, on the left, you have Freddie Mercury, and on the right, um, you've got what my wife calls Fatty Mercury. Anyway, all right, next question, frequently asked question, what do I show on the plans? Great question, engineers. Let's go over what we show on the plans. We show the inside diameter, the length, and the slope. Those are standard, right, that you put on your plans. But then we need to show our RCP class, right? We talked about those, class one through five, but locally, uh, we have class two through five locally. And the class two, I should point this out, that we're only producing class two on really large diameter pipes, and it's very rare. So really, like Mike said earlier, class three through five are common. If you want to do a class two and it's a really large diameter, like a like an 84 inch or something, and, and it's going to save some money, then maybe we do that. The reason is the difference between the steel areas in a class one and a class three pipe in a in a small small diameter are so minimally different that it's actually cheaper for us to just stockpile the steel for a for a class three and just manufacture class three as opposed to one and two at the smaller smaller diameter pipe. So keep that in mind. Lastly, we want to put in a trench detail in there as well. Okay, so the question is, next frequently asked question, which class do I specify? How do I know how to specify these classes? I'm going to give you three different ways to determine the classes. Okay, and then we're going to, and then we'll wrap up here. So the first one is using pipe pack software. This is web-based software that you can get and use through the American Concrete Pipe Association website. I'll show you that later. Uh, you know, in just about five minutes, we'll go through that. Uh, this, the other way is to just use fill height charts. These are very easy to use. And I'm going to show you where you can download these. These can be pulled off of, off of my website, mountainstates, all one word, dot concretepipe, one word, dot org. So mountainstates.concretepipe.org. If you want to write that down so you can grab some fill height charts, 
And uh, the last one and the easiest one, and, and arguably the most fun way to, to determine what class to specify, is just calling me. You can go ahead and call Jason and, and, and make me do it. Make me earn my, my salary by determining what class of pipe you should specify. I can, I can walk you through the fill height charts or I can run the pipe pack software for you and tell you what I would uh, make a recommendation to you for that. This is also really fun because if you get me going on a tangent, I'll probably tell some real fun stories and, and uh, make some jokes and we can laugh and talk about about uh, other members of our association like Randy or Mike and we can make fun of them together. So that's that's probably the most fun way to determine what class to specify, but I'm gonna show you how to do the other ways as well. Let's look first at the fill height charts. This is my website. If you go to mountainstates.concretepipe.org, scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see the fill height charts. You can download these fill height charts. What I did for you was because I frequently get asked about circular pipe, but I also get asked about elliptical pipe because people say, well, I don't have a whole lot of whole lot of you know cover. What should I do with that? And with that, let's do our third poll question. All right, here it is. Our third poll question I'm going to launch here. How many standard classes of elliptical RCP are there? How many standard classes of elliptical? Go ahead and vote. We have some saying three, some saying four, some saying five, and nobody saying six. All right, we're at 60% voted. Go ahead and cast your votes. We're almost dead even at three and five. Interesting. All right, ninety over ninety percent have voted here. Let's go ahead and look at the look at the results. Forty eight percent said three standard classes of elliptical pipe. Fifteen percent said four standard classes of elliptical pipe, and thirty eight percent said five classes of standard elliptical pipe. Nobody said six. That's good because six was incorrect. The forty eight percent of you that said three. Congratulations, you are incorrect as well. And the 38% that said five, you too are incorrect. The 15% of you that said four standard classes of elliptical RCP, you are correct. Congratulations. As always, you win nothing. All right, let's go back here to our fill height charts. Let's look and see what's in the fill height charts. There's a standard, standard detail in these fill height charts, and I want to point out this shows a standard trench, trench versus embankment installation. On the left-hand side here, you- Jason. Yes, Randy. Jason, you didn't tell them why there's only four. Why are there only four, Randy? Why don't you share it with us? There is no class five in elliptical. That is correct. No class five elliptical. So do not spec out a class five elliptical. It only goes up to class four. So here we go. Uh, classes one through four on elliptical pipe. Thank you, Randy. I completely blew over that one there. Okay. For this trench detail, we have trench on the left-hand side and embankment on the right. Embankment is where we're building up over the pipe. So we put the pipe down on the bedding and then we're building the fill up around it. Most of what we install here in Utah and in Idaho is going to be trench installation. However, because of the friction of the sidewalls of our trenches, that is a, a uh, less conservative calculation when we're looking at these fill heights. So embankment is more conservative because you're not going to have the friction forces of the trench. So all of the numbers here that we're gonna show on these fill height charts are for embankment installation, not trench. And that gives us more conservative. If we want to look at what it would be for trench and really get down into it, then we could use that pipe pack software. So that's that's one benefit of pipe pack is you can run it for trench or embankment. So these ones are all gonna be for embankment. This is a table that shows us the different types of installation. And this is very important when we're determining what to do. Type one, type two, type three, and type four. This is a good rule of thumb in the way I think about it. In type one, you're gonna be spending, this is a really, really good bedding, a really strong bedding. This is like similar to what your UDOT bedding is going to be, their requirements. It's a 95% compaction of a category one soil on the haunch and the outer bedding. It gives us the details of the bedding thickness. So that 95% compaction of an A1 or an A3 soil is our category one. Um, on our lower side, which if you remember, our lower side, if we go back, is that area just outside of the haunch. So if we're uh, doing embankment, we need to make sure we've got good lower side um, 
compaction there. Notice if we go down to type four, there's really no compaction required except if we're using a type three soil or excuse me, a category three soil, like a silty clay. And then you go to an 85%. So if you're, if you look at it this way, a type one, you're going to spend more money and time on on in, on the material and getting that good compaction for our bedding and our haunches, right? So you can save a little bit of money on your pipe. You're going to use a lower class of a pipe in a type one installation. A type four installation, which is basically you're just dumping your native material back in, throwing a pipe in and covering it up, and we're not really compacting. That type four, you're going to spend a lot less time and money on the installation and on the material, but you're going to spend more money on your pipe because you're going to need to use a higher class of pipe. So where maybe a class three pipe would have been sufficient, now you might have to class up to a class four or a class five, which is going to be more expensive. So you're, you want to balance that out. Like I mentioned before, a type one installation is typically what you'll see in a UDOT project. Type two and three are more for your municipal. Type four is what you're going to have that old rancher out there throwing a, 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 a drain pipe out in his field. So keep that in mind. All right. So we're going to show you real quick. Hey, Jason. Yes. Can I add just one comment to that? <clears throat> we have four minutes before we get done. So as long as it's quick. Okay, so when you guys, you're probably getting ready to go kind of show them the fill heights. If you have a specific job and you look through the type one, two, three, and four, you'll actually find out because concrete's a structure, a lot of times it doesn't make a big difference and you won't have to change classes unless you have very specific, um, if you just happen to be that worst case condition. So you may not need to call out a type one and waste the money um, you could possibly get away with a type two or three, and that's where these fill heights are so easy to to help out. You know, that is a great point, and it, it, it's something that I was hoping to hit on that I com completely spaced and forgot until you mentioned that. Um, also keep in mind as well that you may call out a type two bedding, but unless you're there making sure it's being installed as a type two, a contractor may install a type three. So that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Look and see if a type two and a type three are going to be the same class. Uh, maybe call out the type two and expect a type three. I, I think that's pretty common and consistent that I've seen is, you know, you'll call out a type one and what if the contractor only installs a type three because we're not there to watch them all the time. So that's another point to keep in mind. You may not need to class up and just call out a lower type, uh, but you also want to make sure that that contractor is installing to that type of, of, of fill. So real quick, this is what our fill height charts look like. This is for a type two bedding. Notice it's color coded. So it has the different colors on the top right-hand side for class one, class two, class three, class four, class five, and then special design. These are based on a soil soil density of 120 pounds per cubic foot with an Ashto HL93 live load. And as I mentioned, the number three, this is an embankment condition. So this is more conservative. All right, let's do a quick example here. We're going to spec the pipe class for a 36-inch RCP with a type two bedding, and the flow line is 16 feet below the the roadway surface. So what we need to do is these fill height charts are based on cover, not, not where the flow line is. So if our flow line of our pipe is 16 feet deep, then that means for a 36 inch pipe with four inch thick walls, it's a B wall like we talked earlier, the cover is 12.67 feet. So we're gonna round up to 13 feet of cover. So we're gonna use 13 feet. So what we do is we take our fill height chart. We notice here it's a type two bedding. We go over to our 36 inch pipe we go to 13 feet, we draw our line over from 36 down to 13 feet, we circle that and we notice that it's a class three, it's 103 pounds per foot per foot. So it's just barely outside of the class two pipe. So a class three would be fine in a type two bedding, right? And then as Mike said, we can compare what it would be for a type three bedding and it's also a class three, so we're good there. This is one of the more common ones that I get asked. Let's say we have a smaller diameter pipe, 18 inch pipe. We've got one foot of cover is all. And it's where we know it's just going to be a type three bedding. What kind of pipe do we need? Let's go back and do it again. We go to our type three bedding. We go to our 18 inch pipe. We go to our one foot pipe. We go over and we notice it's 1384. So a class four pipe is what we would what we would need for this. Additionally, I wanted to point out that a type one bedding for a class five, we can go in these fill height charts, go up all the way to 42 inches or 42 feet deep for a type three bedding. Anything over about 30 feet, we're going to need to do a special design. But as I mentioned before, we can do that special design quite easily here. 
So we're gonna go through quickly with this pipe pack. I'm just gonna show you. I'm gonna take about two minutes. If you ever want to see how this works or just work through it, feel free to go do it. Go to concretepipe.org or the easier way to do it. I'm just gonna tell you, this is how I found this last night um, as I was trying to run a calculation, uh, sample calculation for this. I just Googled pipe pack, P-I-P-E-P-A-C, pipe pack. So you Google that, this will come up, this form, and then you can you can uh, register it. It's all web-based, so you can't download it to your computer. You just run it through the web. And this is what it looks like. Welcome to Pipe Pack. You click on Proceed. You create a project. I created one that's called Utah Test for Mountain States um, by Jason Allen. You go to Continue. You'll click up here at the where it says Three Edge Bearing Analysis. And it comes up with this. So we want to do, I chose to use US customary units instead of the metric because the rest of the world can pound sand. We're gonna use our US customary units here and we're gonna use the ASTM and Ashto loading, okay? Not the CSA, which I believe is our Canadian um, standards, but ASTM and Ashto are what we're gonna use on this. So you go to the next page here, you have four different tabs, pipe information, load installation, factor of safety and results. So our pipe, I wanna do a circular pipe, 24 inches, reinforced B wall thickness, all right? The next next one is the load installation. I'm gonna call it a silty sand. I'm gonna do a soil density of 120 pounds per cubic feet. I wanna run this fill height chart from one foot minimum to 20 feet maximum fill. And I wanna look at, I'm gonna have it analyze a type one, two, three, and four bedding. The live load type, I clicked on Ashto, that is defaults to an Ashto HL93 loading. But you can get in there and change any loads you want. You can go in and put aircraft loads or any, any other loading. You can actually go in and specify what type of loads. Notice also on the installation, I called out a trench instead of the embankment. So this is gonna be a little bit more um, more detailed. It's gonna be a lesser class of pipe most likely because that trench is, is uh, less conservative than the embankment. On the factor of safety, I just always use the default, but you can go in and change that. And then in the results, you click analyze, and this is what it outputs. So we have a summary here of all of our inputs so that you can see what it was. This is an additional uh, explanation of our inputs, and this is what it comes up with. So we can look from one feet deep to 20 feet deep. This shows us for each type of installation and type of bedding, what class of pipe we need. Notice that with the trenches, some of these are going to be for a 24 inch pipe. A lot of these are gonna be class one or class two. So we would use a class three pipe. Um, that's about all that I've got for us here today. Uh, if you want more information on Pipe Pack, I suggest you go and Google it down uh, or get the program, work it a little bit. It's, it's a little bit of fun there for you. But just the, a reminder of the three takeaways. Our RCP, we talked about our RCP basics right, the fundamentals of what, what it is with reinforced concrete pipe. We discussed manufacturing and testing. And then we talked a little bit about what you need to keep in mind for design. And so I uh, just wanna thank you guys for that. This is my contact information here. Most of you should have it if you receive my email to be a part of this presentation. Thank you again for, uh, for, for taking part in that, uh, in this. We had a great time. I enjoyed giving this presentation. We'll plan one of these probably every Friday. So feel free to join in and, and you know get some information there. Please, please, please stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands. And if you have any specific questions, I don't see any any real questions from anybody here on the on the presentation. So I'll go ahead and say, uh, oh, I do have a couple. Sorry. Let's see if I'll go through a couple of these now. If you guys want to stay on, um, Dan Isom from uh, DAE asked if I will come to their office in those pajamas. Dan, I would be glad to. Absolutely. Um, someone requested that we just mute Randy altogether, and I think that's just mean. Um, Nathan Smith asked if we have any pictures of Randy in his jammies. Uh, I don't know, Randy, we probably ought to get some pictures of you in the jammies. And I'll tell you what, how about this? Since I can't take anyone out to lunch right now and do any lunch and learns, if you guys want to get on our Facebook, I made a post this morning of me in my pajamas. If you want to post a picture of you in your pajamas, I'll choose the best one, and I will mail you a $25 gift card to the restaurant of your choice so that when all of these lockdowns and shutdowns lift, you can take your, your, uh, your significant other out for a meal. What do you say to that? So go ahead and post pictures of yourself in your jammies. Randy, that includes you. You're welcome to do I, that also. If you I, choose yours. I thought this was clothing, clothing optional. 
Yeah, it has to be it has to be PG thirteen at best, Randy. So no, none of your uh, R rated uh, posts there anymore. So there we go. Um, let's see here. A couple of other questions here. I know common class three is standard, but how often does class four and class five get used? Um, we see class four and class five getting used mostly in in shallow berry situations. Uh, class three, most of the time. Uh, when you're doing like a subdivision or development, and even a lot of times as we looked in those in those uh, fill height charts, a class three is going to cover a lot of your of your uh, your your cases there. But class four and class five, we'll see those in like heavy highway loads. If it's shallow berry in like a highway, we see those at the airport a lot, airport loading or railroad loading as well. You'll see those quite often. Um, so. Rick also suggested that he's going to need therapy after those queen pictures. I know Freddie Mercury is kind of a weird looking guy. I apologize that I put him on there. Um, obviously, you weren't talking about the pictures of, of me. Um, and uh, looks like Dave Adamson asked if this presentation is recorded for later viewing. As a matter of fact, Dave, yes, it is. I have recorded this presentation. I will make it available on my website. It's probably going to take a few days, but I will be sure to post this to the website. So if anybody wants to watch uh, this later, those are all of the questions. Feel free to send any questions you have to me directly, and I'd be happy to answer those. Um, anyways, that's all I've got. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Go like us on Facebook and post pictures of your jammies, and I'll choose the best one and send you a gift certificate. So thanks again. Have a great day. Be safe. Stay healthy.